All right. Hey y'all. Um, so I'm going to lecture today on the principles of art and design and goods postmodern principles, kind of putting them together because they're related, you know, in different ways. Um, and like, you know, everybody still uses there's modern principles, but like, you know, the, the current ones still apply. And like this last lecture, I'm uh, just using more contemporary references. Um, yeah, so we'll get started. All right, so this first picture that was on um, the intro slide and uh, now here is um, a photograph by Pia Riviorla, River Riviorla, um, and it's called So Lonely and it's done in 2020. Um, so in two-dimensional arts, um, such as painting and photography, this organization of visual elements is usually called a composition. So this is an example of a composition. Um, but a broader term that applies to the entire range of visual arts is design. The word design indicates both the process and organizing of visual elements and the product of that process. So, um, this photograph is a, both a composition and, um, also, uh, there is design in the building of it and design in the pattern of which she took it. So composition design. Um, so the principles of design. So the principles of design provide an understanding um, not only of how artists work, but also of how design affects us. Um, so these include unity and variety, balance, symmetrical and asymmetrical, um, contrast, emphasis, and subordination, movement and directional forces, uh, repetition, pattern and rhythm, and proportion and scale. So first we have unity and um, in works of art that um, occur when an art and design and unity occurs in, ugh, sorry, unity occurs in a work of art when um, the art and design elements are similar or, or identical. Um, very few artworks have a, like full unity because, you know, there's a variety. Um, but we'll get to that next. Um, so Carmen uh, Herrera is um, a Cuban American artist who is 105 years old. Um, there is a Netflix doctor documentary um, about her, if it's still up, I believe. Um, so she does fairly unified works. So they're not obviously fully unified, um, but no, they're about fully. I mean, because they're not symmetrical, but like they balance each other out. They have the same visual elements and a lot of the like repeated patterns. So hers artwork demonstrates a lot of unity um variety so variety is the opposite of unity variety is achieved when design elements are varied in size color shape texture or other attributes um variety provides diversity and um acts to counter unity so whereas here um some people would say that some works that have a lot of unity might be boring um you know you could think about like mark rothko um if anybody's familiar with him he does like the cult like you know colorful paintings that are just you know one solid color or like you know just like a color in the middle um and then like a different background but um it is pr to provide variety and diversity so um this work right here by larry walker larry walker is uh carol walker carol walker's uh father also an artist as you can tell um and this is his listen to the beat um from a wall series and he does a lot of mixed media arts um and that deals with the African-American experience with the black experience in the United States. Um, so this one has a lot of variety, as you can tell, because variety comes like, especially if artists are using mixed media because it's a variety of materials. Um, this one, you know, it's like not symmetrical. I mean, you have, yes, you have a line, but it's not symmetrical on either sides. So variety. So balance, um, I'm sure everybody knows what balance is. I don't have a lot of it. Um, so balance refers to a distribution of visual weight of shapes and forms. Um, so maybe you all have heard of this um, because it won like the 2020 design um, award, something like that, 2020 design award. It's got a name, but I forgot. Is it MacArthur? Maybe not, maybe, I can't remember. Um, Anyways, so Rael and San Fratello um, and Omar Rios designed this teeter-totter wall, and this is like a socially engaged art experiment or art um, 
kind of interaction and they have these like pink teeter-totters that they set up between the border walls and people on, like of Mexico and the U.S. Um, and uh, people like like it was made so that it could easily go in there and like interact and kind of create an intervention with what already exists but we will talk about interventions um, in our socially engaged chapter um, or you know section um, but yeah so balance because you know sea salts have balance um, so there are two, there are a few different types of balance. So symmetrical balance is achieved when objects are reflected or repeated on either side of an axis. This type of symmetrical balance is also called bilateral, bilateral symmetry. Um, I'm sure y'all know what like symmetry is. Everybody like wants a symmetrical face. Nobody has one except like, I don't know, maybe some models or something. Um, but here we have a work by Samira. Alakazende, Alakazende, I'm going to think that's right, um, and it's from her series Double, this one's called Peace, um, and she uses old photographs that she finds, um, and like replicates them, and, oh, uh, you know, symmetrical, uh, and she does a lot of work that speaks to, what is it, like, um, the, like, following the um in iran whenever women were no longer required to wear the veil so kind of like the the culture shift at that time and then we also have um like symmetrical balance can also be achieved by arranging multiple identical parts around a single axis so here it's kind of like it, you know if you fold a piece of paper in half symmetrical balance and symmetrical balance can also you know around an axis so um mandalas so I feel like somebody said that they draw mandalas, maybe more than one, I don't remember, um, in your intro, but, you know, the mandalas have a symmetrical balance, and, um, here are two kind of contemporary examples of mandalas, so this is Sanford, Sanford Biggers over here, mandala of co-option, and here we have, like, some, uh, like, Buddha statues that were, like, made in Mexico, and then they, um, have gold chains on them and shoelaces in the center and um and then they're on pedestals that were made in China and it, the the theme around it is like how easy it is to co-opt another culture um because it's like the Buddhist symbol which is a symbol from Chinese culture uh but it was a object made in Mexico and here it is in the United States by this American artist covered in um things associated with uh hip-hop culture and black culture um so you know the co-option of culture mandala of co-option so and then over here we have damien hurst damien hurst does a lot of um does a lot of different stuff but he um has like a butterfly theme in some of his works uh so this is his butterfly mandala and it's like butterfly wings like all over you no know, repeated and round um so and then we have asymmetrical balance asymmetrical balance is a is achieved when different shapes or forms of an artwork are arranged in such a way to create a sense of balance. Um, so that's like this work right here by Feng Li Jun um, that is Untitled Swimmer. So, you know, it, it adds a lot more visual interest, you know, to have just one person on the other side in the blank space of the water um, as like the thing that balances the person and the fact that, you know, the orange and the blue complementary colors. Um, so yeah, asymmetrical balance. Um, another way to achieve asymmetrical balance, the left and right sides are not going to be always the same. Um, so here's like the United States. It is a rectangle, but it's not balanced. Um, various elements are balanced around or felt, um, or felt a implied center of gravity. So it's like, you know, this kind of feels like the implied center. Um, so this piece right here is the Namjoon Pox Electronic Superhighway. And Nam Joon Pak what, is a Korean artist that, um, like, he's like the, the father of modern video art. So, this is, um, you know, an image of whoops, the United States. And then, like, within each state, there is, um, like, little TVs and advertisements. So, um, that, like, represent different things about the United States and, like, where things are going in the future that well this was in the future that was back in 1995 so as you can see these are like 
these TVs are like the big box TVs, not like flat things we have today. Um, <clears throat> so contrast is achieved by pairing opposites such as light and dark colors or smooth and rough textures together in a single work of art. Um, <clears throat> the, these are works by Ronald Jackson. I really like his portraits. Um, and he's an artist, like he didn't start painting until I think like later in life. Um, so, and you know, well, like, like he did a long time ago, but I think he like had a full career as like in the army and stuff. And then he like got back to painting. Um, anyways, so he does these really interesting paintings. These are two different ones. Um, so this one on the left is the veil of bitter songs. And this one is a study of a black man's soul on the right. And, um, he has like the, the, the veil there to kind of, you know, it's like a floral pattern and like non-threatening. Um, and especially, you know, with, um, black men, it's always like trying to soften them because of they, uh, from the time that they are little boys, they are, uh, adultified. Um, but anyways, contrast, there's a lot of visual contrast in here because of the way that he uses the different colors, um, and the, uh, like the masks over the face and the, like that adds visual contrast. All right. So emphasis, um, emphasis is a way of directing the viewer's eye to the most important aspect of the work. Artists may create emphasis by using a variety of methods, including size, color, placement, or contrast. If the emphasis is on a specific spot or figure, it is called a focal point. Um, <clears throat> so emphasis, there is, it's pretty obvious where the emphasis is in this photograph. It's right here. Um, this is also the focal point. Um, what's interesting about this is this picture is, um, you know, it looks like these are real people, but this is a photograph by Isaac Cordell and he makes, uh, and it's called Follow the Leaders, P Politicians Discussing Climate Change. He, make these, he makes these miniature like little figures and things and then places them like, uh, you know, in different, like this is on the street in a puddle and you know, they're sinking. And he then he takes a picture of it. So it looks like they are real people like life size because of the scale at which he takes a picture, but it's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> And so I'll tell you about the last part. So um, through subordination, an artist creates a neutral area of lesser interest that keeps us from being distracted from the areas of emphasis. So obviously the, this is like the neutral area. This is the neutral area of less resistance. This is, so this is subordination. This is the focal point. <clears throat> All right, so movement or directional forces. Um, movement and directional forces are ways in which the viewer's eye is directed in a work. It can imply motion, hint at a narrative, or simply create a pleasing effect. Uh, sensations pr produced by the di direction of lines standing still, you know, standing still is up and down. Being at rest is laying, you know, horizontal. Like, obviously, if you're laying down, it looks like you're at rest. Um, and then being in motion is... Um, up the hill. So here, this is more of a, both a being in motion and like a standing still because her body is uh, standing. So it's like that directional force of power, but also the movement of the wind um, is caught through this directional force. Um, and this is a photograph by Ida Mulune. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know how to say that part, but it's like part three. Um, Dinikish? I don't know how to say the title of it, but, um, she is a contemporary Ethiopian photographer, um, known for powerful portraits, as you see here. And, um, yeah, Move directional forces. Um, uh, <clears throat> so next we have rhythm. Rhythm occurs when shapes or forms are repeated in a, within a work of art. Rhythm is a visual beat or tempo within a work of art. Repetition is the simplest way to create rhythm so here the rhythm occurs you know it's like if you pick, pick if anybody like in the music and like you see like the or like if you ever do voice memos and like the sound of like the voice is kind of what this reminds me of um because it's like bigger and littler and like different colors um so this is by julie Marin. it's called botanica and these are like acorn caps i believe that she like filled with color and then has arranged so through the rep repetition of um the shapes and in different like orders but also like close together it creates rhythm 
<clears throat> um, another way is like repetition, as it said over here. Um, repetition is the simplest way to create rhythm. So repetition here. Uh, repetition is a regular reoccurrence of visual elements, uh, lends unity, continuity, flow, and emphasis. Uh, so Sakir Gokinbag, there's a lot of like, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but this is a shoe installation and um, I believe this is a Turkish, yeah, Turkish artist that is currently living and working in Germany. And repetition is created by like cutting off of the tips of the shoes and then like, you know, like this. And then um, pattern is the all over design created by, you know, repetitive elements. Um, so here the shoe tips have created a pattern. You know, we see a lot of patterns on clothing and furniture and just about anywhere. Um, so pattern is most common design strategy in the textile art tradition. Um, you know, clothing, like I said. So here, this is by Abdule Con Conate, Conte. Um, and it is Le Papillon Bleu, and uh, which just means the blue butterfly. Um, and I only know that because we used to have a papillon when I was growing up. Um, a dog, and I remember that it was because of papillon for butterflies. Sorry, that was off topic. Um, he is a textile artist, uh, from, I believe he's from Africa. Oh, uh, Mali, but you know, that's in Africa. And um, he's pretty interesting because like, yeah, well, there's getting to be more male textile artists in contemporary art, but it is not traditionally a male oriented field, so. And then scale, scale is the size relation of one thing to another, like how big it is. Uh, so Clay, Kleis o Oldenburg and Kloos van Bruggen, Kloos, um, these are flying pins. These artists um, often create, uh, you know, large scale pieces that play with um, your idea of like scale. Yeah, about proportion and like how large things could, should be. Um, so obviously, Bowling pins are usually not larger than people. Um, but, you know, this is an example of an artist that plays with scale. Um, another, like, obviously, this is also scale. Not this, one. this one. So, this is also an artist that plays with scale because, you know, we're doing little, little and big, still scale. And proportion is the size relationship in parts to a whole. So the difference between scale and proportion is proportion is like within like one work. Um, and scale would be like, you know, this is like very large compared to regular pins, you know. Um, so proportion is the size relation in parts to the whole. So proportionately, this is the largest, um, you know, figure. And then this one is second largest. So it's like... Yeah, I feel like y'all know proportion. Um, the relationship, so, you know, one fourth of the painting, that's the relationship of one of the size to so the whole painting. One fourth, I would say. Um, so this is by Sherry Sharon, um, a passion juvenile, and he is a artist originally by the name of Joseph Kin Kinkonda, um, and lives and works in the Dominican Republic or something like that um yeah so he does a lot of kind of like pop culture-esque uh painting all right so let's talk about Goud's postmodern principles um which are appropriation juxtaposition recon recontextualization layering interaction of text and images hybridity gazing and representing all right so appropriation um, appropriation in art is the use of pre-existing objects or images with little or no transformation applied to them. Uh, so cause does a lot of appropriation, K-A-W-S. Um, here is a appropriation with The Simpsons. It still very much looks like The Simpsons, obviously, but it's within his signature style, which has like the little X's in their eyes. Um, but you know, his style is always like kind of similar, um, to that. And like he has he's done like a collaboration with like sesame street and stuff like that so appropriation um 
juxtaposition. Juxtaposition means placing two or more things side by side, often with the intention of comparing or contrasting the elements. Um, so this is an image by Stephanie Sujuko, um, Dodge and Burn, Visual Storage. So this is obviously has a lot of juxtaposition, the, the green and the white. And, um, you know, this is playing on the idea of, uh, like photography and like the because you know the green screen and then the um what's that stuff called that like the vectors i don't it's like the vector stuff that doesn't show up on the computer um and like the card for like picking up colors and um then it's juxtaposed against the like the victorian dress and juxtaposed against like african sculptures and uh, the, that like little picture card has like a very racist history because it you know it wouldn't pick up uh darker skin tones for a long time until it was like remade not that long like in the 80s i feel like something like not that long ago um so yeah juxtaposition <clears throat> so the deliberate barring of an image for this new context is called recontextualization um, recontextualization helps the artist um, comment on the image's original meaning and the viewer's association with either the original image or the real thing. Um, so here, this is by David Hammonds, and this is the African American flag. It's very obvious where this original context came from, from the American flag. Um, but instead of having, um, you know, red, white, and blue, it is green, black, and red. Um, colors of Africa. <clears throat> of Africa. Um, so he was essentially recontextualizing the American flag, um, in a way that this is for people that are African American, you know, because, you know, their culture was stolen from them, but I digress. So David Hammond's recontextualization of the American flag. All right. So layering, um, the use of many images layered on top of each other with varying degrees of transparency. Exactly like it sounds. So this artist right here is from the UK, Stephen Gill, and this is untitled from the series Hockney Flowers. So here we have like an image of a fire, um, firefighter that's like putting out like a fire. Um, and then over it, there are flowers, like, he, like especially where the fire hose is, it's like some flowers there. So layering of images um with varying degrees of transparency so you can like see the like some flower petals over here and like some fire but it's kind of like you can't see it very much so layering um interaction of text and images um is interplay between words and images just like it sounds like a meme um so sean hookins um creates these works that are very much like memes um but he like does these paintings painting recreations of uh like classical paintings like well-known paintings and then he puts uh contemporary sayings over them um so this one says twerking like a boss and this one says i've long i waited a long time to be disappointed by someone like you so um interplay of words and images so he takes it like you know kind of rethinking what these people would be thinking about if it was like today or something like that which can also be a recontextualize recontextualization in a way um so hybridity so um hybridity incorporates uh various forms of new media into artwork so this um is an example by asa jimos asa jimos yeah it's a it's a um, group from Brazil and then their brothers and they create this artworks and they incorporate new forms of media into their artwork. So they have all different types of, um, like they don't just do painting. They don't just do um, like all different types of media. So this is has like these like light balls. I don't know what they're made out of exactly. Um, and these sculptures. So it's, you know, the hybridity of all of these things working together that are different yet related. Another way that um, artists achieve hybridity is by blending cultures. 
Um, so here's an example by Frank Buffalo High. He is a uh, Native American artist and um, he blends, you know, contemporary American culture and uh, capitalism with, um, you know, the Native American aesthetic and like culture of Native America. So um, here it's like a commentary on like bison burgers and, you know, the Native American aesthetic, but also like the fast food culture. Um, so it's like they went from eating bison to eating like bison burgers and like just hamburgers in general. Um, and then also this one over here. Uh, so that one's called fast food burger. And then this one is a Buffalo dancers study. Um, so, you know, people are always, anytime someone's going to do something, they're always going to have their phone out. Um, it's just like the melding of, you know, contemporary culture with the past. And then gazing. So gazing is associated with issues of, of knowledge and pleasure is also a form of power, controlling perception of what is real and natural. Um, so here we have Betty Sayers' um, Liberation of Aunt Jemima from 1972, which is still a very relevant um, work today. So Betty Sayer is a um, black artist from the U.S. and uh, she does a lot of work that addresses uh, racial disparities and uh, injustices. So this one is about the gays and um, the gays is about who has power. So here she's questioning, um, you know, a lot of us grew up with Aunt Jemima and now they finally changed the person. But, um, you know, Aunt Jemima, the image of Aunt Jemima is, was like created, the mammy image, like by white people. And it's kind of like questioning the, uh, like who created the images that, are so prevalent within our culture and you know the acceptance of the fact that like until this year they were just you know out there and they are very blatantly racist and they have a history of uh, like racist imagery so here she is taking back power um and flipping the gaze um because the gaze of you know the power was within the like in the Aunt Jemima bottle before like it belonged to the white man because like it's like the the, deg the degradation of um the black female but um here she's taking it back by having instead of uh like Aunt Jemima has a gun and she's she has like the black power fist and um and then there's a picture in there that like in the Aunt Jemima the mammy figure is holding a white baby that or a mixed race child that is also uh meant to allude to like the history of sexual assault but in this way she's like changing the gaze and bringing the power back to Aunt Jemima and to the black woman um and you know subverting the gaze changing the uh narrative so to speak so and then I think this is our last point yep um so representing representing describes the strategy of locating one's artistic voice within one's own personal history and culture of origin. Um, so a lot of artists do this because they are talking, they create artwork that deals with, you know, their own personal journeys. And here is one um, such person. So Yeshe Garbaz, um, Becoming from 2008 to 2010. Um, and she, this is a video that um, has like pictures that, like scroll or I guess it's like a moving image of pictures that move that like go through and it, it documents her gender reaffirming surgery um so she is a transgender female yeah and so this is a like a piece that documents her own surgery and her own gender reaffirming journey um and transition so this is her representing um her own voice within both her um culture of origin and her own personal history because at the same time a long time ago this piece you know wouldn't be possible well yeah so that is it for this lecture um all right just i'll email y'all with whatever i got else i gotta say bye